first one that God gave me is that God needs to be first in our life. How do we put him first? What do we do? What's that take? Well, I really believe it involves three things to make God first in our life. First off, besides that personal relationship with the Lord, I'm going to be talking about actions and things we need to do that will keep the Lord first. First off, we have this heart and mind attitude. We have the belief. We have the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know, believe that God's word is true and that he has a plan for our lives. He has a plan for your life. And it is not supposed to be a daily heavy burden. It may be at times. You're not supposed to get exhausted all the time. You may at times, but not continuously. Unless that's a health issue. I have to say that sometimes health issues will do that. So what do we do? We learn from him. We come to him. The first things we need to do is, one, is have a personal time, a personal devotion. How do we do that? You say, well... A lot of different ways. One way, when our boys were little, um, they were preschoolers, I just took a three by five card and I wrote on it Philippians 4, 4 through 8. That's Philippians 4, 4 through 8. And it starts off with rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And it goes on in everything, give thanks. And with prayer and supplication, make your request known to the Lord and thank him for everything. And then at the end of verse 8, it talks about what to think about. Think on these things, and it lists a whole series of things to think about. So I wrote that Bible verse on a, on a card. Two little active boys, they were ADHD, ADHD, and one of them got grown up, the other one didn't. But anyway, he knows that. But they just wrote this on there, and, and I put it on my kitchen counter because I walked past my kitchen counter all day long. It was in the back of my house, and I had to walk through the kitchen to get to the washer and dryer, and right across from the washer and dryer was, was the back door. And so I walked past it, and as I saw it, it said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, Lord, as I'm walking to the washing machine, I'm thinking, what can I rejoice in? I'm rejoicing I have a washer and dryer that works. Yay, Lord, because little boys make lots of laundry. Just say it. You might know that already. A man that runs every day makes lots of laundry. I needed that washer and dryer. So thank you, Lord, for my washer and dryer. Praising you, Lord, for that. Walk back through again, it says, and again, I say rejoice. Thank you, Lord, that everybody is healthy today. Some days they weren't. Some days they were sick. But I'm thanking you, Lord, that today everybody is healthy. And so as I walked past it, it said, make your requests known to the Lord. So I tell him what I needed for that day. It talks about this, that, and this. And every time I walked past it, whether I was letting the boys out the back door, whether I was going to the washing machine, where I was going into the kitchen to get a drink of water or to give the boys a drink or to start, the, start lunch, I, every time I walked past it, I would go through a next little section, whether it was a word or a phrase in that verse. I did that for four years. I would use that same Bible verse over and over and over again. Running after these boys, I was exhausted. And so when I got time to rest, I needed a period of rest. And so I didn't have time to do something else. And this was my Bible study. That's one way. Focus on it. Today, I'm using an app on my Bible called U Version Bible. And I like to use it because it's got a verse of the day in it. And with it, I can read the chapter. I've done that for quite a while, for the last three, four years. Just recently, I started doing a Bible study that a friend gave me. And I've been working through that at breakfast. Some people have told me that they will read a devotion on their on their on their phone and put it up on their on their um, running machine or on and as they run they can read it. Now I, I tend to bounce up and down when I'm running, and so my glasses won't focus. So I can't do that, but some people can. Another gal told me that she listened to some of her favorite podcasts on her drive into work. She had about an hour drive into work, and so that's why she why she did her devotion. Another friend said that she would put her Bible right beside her bed and she would read a psalm as she went to sleep at night. And actually it was putting her to sleep and she loved it. It was calming her heart and her spirit. So there's so many different ways to find a way to do a Bible study or to spend time with the Lord. Maybe it's just a single verse you can cling to. I know when I've had really difficult times, I just would say one verse over and over again. Sometimes it's just the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, I need your help. I love the ones by God will supply all my needs. And when things seem to be crashing around me for one reason or another, I come back to that. By God will supply all my needs. 
Maybe it's a, bur a song, a worship song that just runs through your head over and over again. Maybe it's an old favorite hymn. I need him. Oh, I need him. Every hour, I need him. Find your own way to worship the Lord. Spending time with him in his word or listening to things that, that speak of him and his truth. That's number one. Number two, spend some time praying. Now, we do pray at meals. We pray at bedtime in our household. Prayed with the boys when they were little. But I've also found it so important to pray by myself. And yes, you may not be able to pray with your husband. He may not want to pray with you, but you can always pray for him. Look at Stomi Armadia's book. I'm not sure I'm saying her last words, but she has The Power of a Praying Wife. She has um, books about praying for your children. All of her books are filled with scripture verses to pray over them if you don't know what to pray. Go back to the 23rd Psalm and pray that one if you don't know what to pray. Or go to the Lord's Prayer that maybe you memorized as a child and pray that. But let God know about what you're thankful for. This comes back to Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Flip. <coughs> Let God know what you're thankful for. Ask him for what you want. Tell him what concerns you. He says to not pray about it, not worry about anything, but to pray about everything. It's really different when you stop and pray about it because it changes from the focus of, oh me, oh my, the world's falling apart. To recognize that God is with you. He hears your prayers. The Bible says he hears your cries. And he answers us. Oftentimes, it's not what we think we want. But it's what he knows is best. And if you don't hear a yes answer, then maybe you say wait or not now. Or maybe he has to answer no. That's not for your best choice. You know, God loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. That involves spending time with him in his word and in prayer. The third thing that will really help us get together with other believers is this: is getting together with other believers. Hebrews 10, um, 10, 25 says, Don't forsake the assembling together of believers. For most of us, that will be a worship service, a church service at your local, wherever you tend to go to church. And most of the time, it's on Sunday morning. But if you're a pastor's wife, it may not be that Sunday morning worship because you might have lots of other responsibilities. If you're in the, in, teaching in Sunday school, it may not be that worship service. For many years, uh, particularly when the boys were little, I said they were sick a lot. My husband was um, leading one. Of, he was leading the youth group, and he was on the praise and worship team. Sometimes he sometimes he led it. Sometimes he did not. But the boys often got sick, it seemed to see, like every Sunday. And I couldn't go to church with two sick little kiddos. But I didn't want to miss out on this forsaking, not to get together believers. <coughs> Let me repeat that in a minute. Mm. I didn't want to miss this, missing together with other believers. Why? Because when we get together with others, we share the truths of God's word. We learn from each other. Together, we get the support and the camaraderie and the ability to support one another as we walk out our faith on a daily basis. So during that time when our kiddos were little, my gathering together with other believers was a Bible study that met in our home once a week. And yes, the kiddos were sick, they were sick often, so I give them their medicine and put them to bed. And they were in the back with their sinus infection or cold or whatever it was. They had ear infections often. And I put them in, they go to bed. And so we'd be out be able to go out in the living room so I could be with other people. There was one time I had a, a, a girlfriend that lived next door and they had really been burned at a church that they'd been at previously. And I didn't really get into why or what happened, but they had stopped going to church. And the Lord told me, Joyce, you need to get together with my next door neighbor and you need to walk with her, see if she'll go for a walk with you. And you need to talk about your prayers and pray together. This is the way you can minister to her. And so I became her gathering together with another believer. It's not the best option, but it was her way to get back into fellowship with someone else who was a believer and to be able to start interacting with someone else who 
who also believed and also share her prayer request. There was a gal I talked to, I coached for a while, whose husband um, worked on, away from home during the week. And he came home Friday night and then often had to leave Sunday night. And he really, really wanted to take his boat out on the lake every Sunday. And he wanted his wife and kids to go with him. She said, Joyce, how am I supposed to get any Bible study in when I, or go to worship or do anything with anybody else when, when we're at church on every Sunday morning? I asked her, I said, are, the, are there any ladies' Bible studies in your area? Any ch your church have any ladies' Bible studies you could go to? And she found one she could go to during the week. I said, then make that your gathering together with believers. And yes, it'd be great if her husband would go, but remember, we can't make our husbands be the spiritual head. The best thing is for us to take care of our own spiritual needs and then let our husbands come up with his, their choices and follow the Lord as he convicts them, not as we convict them. Maybe your husband doesn't want to go to church on Sunday mornings, but doesn't mind if you go. Well, then go ahead and go. Just let him know, honey, you're always welcome if you want to come. And let it go. Don't keep pestering him. God will convict him when it's the right time. Your job is to follow what God asked you to do and to pray for your husband, not to try to pressure him to be going to church. But Joyce, he won't lead any prayers. I know. Sometimes they won't. It doesn't mean you can't. Pray for the kids yourself. It doesn't mean you can't get the kids a children's Bible and start reading it with them at bedtime. Your husband may want to join you. He may not. Most of the time when we start doing what we know is right, our husbands see our change of actions and they want to join us. They want to come to church with us. I had one gal that I was um, coaching her. Um, she, her husband had filed for divorce and she had gone to a lawyer and the lawyer had, had encouraged her to go ahead and file for divorce because there was quite a bit of money involved if it did go all the way through. And, and that was one way that they could legally fight um, so that she could get enough money to support herself and the kids. And uh, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a lawyer and I don't understand all those things, but that's what, that's what the lawyer suggested she do. But she still wanted to see if there was any, any way that she could save her marriage. So one of the first things we said was, are you reading your Bible every day? She said, yes, I've been reading Ephesians, I think is what she said. And I said, keep reading it. And then as we went on and we coached week after week, I said, is there any church that you and the kids would feel comfortable going to? Because her husband hadn't moved out. They were still going through this whole divorce thing and what was going to happen here, there, and the other way, and doing research and all this same kinds of things that had to happen because there had been an affair and all, all kinds of money involved and it was kind of messy. I said, but is there a church that you would feel comfortable going to? She says, you know, my friend is invited to me, and she named the name of her church. I said, can you go? Would the kids feel comfortable there? She had teenagers, and she said, I think they would. I've heard they had a great youth group. So she decided one Sunday to pack up the kids and herself and go to that church. Well, the kids ended up loving it. She ended up finding friends there and people that would support her. She got involved first off with a small group of ladies that wanted to get together with her. And they started supporting her in what she was doing and wanting to restore her marriage, if at all possible. But if not, at least become the best godly woman she could be for her, for her children and herself. As she went on with that process, eventually their issues did get resolved with her husband. She made changes. He made changes because she changed and he decided he wanted to go to church with her. It wasn't because she pushed. It wasn't because she nagged. It wasn't because she said, I'm not going to get together with you again unless you go back to church. No, it's because she did what she knew was right. And she set the example. And she didn't, she didn't say anything to him about it. Why? Because when we say it, we become like a nagging, 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 nagging little fellow. And if you go back and read Proverbs, it says that it's better to live on a rooftop than to live with a nagging wife. And, and 1 Peter chapter 3 says, let your actions win your husband over to the Lord, not your words. So go do what you know is right. Read your Bible. Go to a lady's Bible study. Go to church if you can. Maybe it's not on Sunday morning. Maybe you can go on a Wednesday night. Maybe there's a Sunday night service you can go to. Maybe there's a Saturday service for some places. Find a place where you can worship where you can gather with other believers and, and do it. One gal said to me, she goes, you know, Joyce, I was raised Pentecostal. My husband's a Catholic. What do we do about that? She goes, I don't want to go to his service. I mean, he, they're also this way and that way, and he didn't want to go to mine. I said, well, 
are you going to any kind of thing that does meet your needs? She goes, yes, yes, I found a ladies' Bible study that works. She was also going to another church service at another church that she liked. And I said, have you ever looked online to find out if there's any Catholic services in the area where you live that have a more contemporary service and that maybe, uh, and there are some Pentecostal or charismatic, and sometimes they're called charismatic Catholic churches out there. She said, you know what? She told me a couple weeks ago, she said, I found one. And I went and I liked it. She said, so what can you do? I said, can you go to that service maybe Sunday morning? Maybe your husband would like to join you eventually and you can keep going to your, your midweek service with the ladies you like at the church you feel more comfortable. She goes, well, I can try it. And she did. And eventually her husband joined her there. 